Welcome to LOA Today. Walt Thiessen and Life Coach Wendy Dillard here. Today is Thursday, March the 8th, 2018, 4 p.m. Eastern Time, your second daily dose of happy for the day. And uh, we are experiencing here in New England uh, something that, well, first of all, most of the country has this kind of cliche. We especially have it here. If you don't like the weather, just wait a few minutes and it will change. And that's exactly what has happened. Uh, because we woke up this morning with about nine inches of snow, and that's now down to about three inches. <laughs> wow. I guess the sun must be out. Actually not. It's just warm. It, it, it was cold. Oh. It snowed, and it warmed up, and it's like it, 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 it's like you, you saw it pile up, and then you saw it piled out. <laughs> like, whoa, this is weird. <laughs> it was one of those snows where uh, if you go out and you start you know, pushing the snow off of the roof of the car, you, you push a little bit and everything fl- flies off because it's all sticking together and it's all sliding on the roof. You know? <laughs> it was, it, it's a weird snow. Yeah. But it, it was nice while I was here. <laughs> it's just disappearing really fast. That's all. Let, let's put it this way. It's disappearing so fast, Louise is not going to have a chance to get her skis on. That's how fast it's going away. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's a bummer. Well, yes and no. She's decided that she's done with skiing for the year. She, she wanted the snow okay. because she likes how pretty it is. But she's done with skiing for the year, and, and uh, she told me she, she needs to uh, do some more working out and get in better shape so she can really do it for longer periods of time. And so that's the goal during the summer is going to be to get in better shape so that next year she can ski longer. Hey, it's nice to have a long-term goal. It is. It's a good one. And she feels good about it, which is probably going to make it likely that it'll actually happen. Very so, nice. Yeah. So, hey, Walt, do you have any wins for today? I have a, a weird win. I've been talking the last few days about how I had this little nist, this list of niggly little things that had to be done that just kept hanging on, and that they had to be, they were in the way. I I couldn't get to doing the editing of the book. I couldn't get to all the stuff I wanted to get to until this niggly list got out of the way. And I'm hey, very. By the way, I love the word niggly. Niggly is a good word. Before. I'm listening to you use it. I think it's awesome. I'm going to adopt it. <laughs> it. It is a great word, niggly. I mean, I, I have no idea niggly. if it's a, even a, an urban dictionary, but it should be if it isn't because it just it has the right <laughs> feel to it, you know? <laughs> it, okay. it applies you these little the niggly stuff on a list. It's like these little gnat like things that just annoy you, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but the good news is that as of a half hour ago, the niggly list is done. I am past it. I am so happy about that. And I actually took a, a oh, moment God. to celebrate. I did my mirror work as celebration. How about that? Oh, very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a great feeling when you have that sense of accomplishment that you've got things taken off the plate and now you can work on something that you really want to get involved in. It's also amazing how when it's something that is niggly like that, you, you, you do it kind of with your nose held and when it's done, it's like, oh, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a sigh of relief and everything, all the stress drains out of your body. It's great. Good for you. Good for you. So, yeah, I mean, it took till Thursday to do it, but I got it done. And and the niggly stuff, I mean, it actually is important in one sense. I, I call it niggly because it's just stuff I didn't want to do. Um, but it is important. It generates income for me, so I certainly am not going to complain about that. Um, just not my cup of tea shall we put it <laughs> not what i really want to do <laughs> i'd much rather do podcasts they're much more fun <laughs> of course of course so. well i have um here here's my daily update oh okay on on project x um nothing huge to report but there was a, a slight change in the shift in the energy um and i noticed that because remember project x is about letting one thing go and bringing something new in something big and i'm still yeah i'm still doing the the stuff that's about to end Mm -hmm. um but while i was doing it i felt really uh like had a short fuse oh kind of like things that i normally would do that i kind of did with a sense of grace you know even if it wasn't something i love to do i still did it and you know life went on and i felt a what are, are you saying that it was niggly kind of got under my skin i guess you could call that niggly that's niggly <laughs> that is definitely niggly. all right it qualifies yeah um and i was really paying attention to my inner dialogue and while i was doing this stuff my inner dialogue is like oh god i can't wait until this is over or i'm just so ready to not be doing this anymore i'm ready to move on 
you know, it's like, oh, I don't, I, I'm just done. I feel done. <laughs> and so, you know, that was my inner dialogue. But in my inner dialogue, I also have a lot of communication with my inner being. So I hear what I'm saying to myself. And then I kind of ask my inner being like, so where am I with this? Why all of a sudden today am I feeling this level of, Ugh! Hmm. and what I got was this is kind of a natural process. And what I heard was I'm going through a grieving process in a way. Oh, really? Or it's part of the grieving process. Well, you know, when one thing ends and another thing begins, there is a little bit of sadness. I mean, there's like a mixture of sadness because like I was thinking about, oh, I won't be doing this and I won't be talking to this person, you know, and these things are going to shift. And I felt a little teary eyed. I felt a little lump in my throat like, oh, I'm really going to miss this person or this thing. And then the next thing I knew, I'd get this, oh, I go, I can't wait till this is never again in my life. And so what I was, you know, capturing is this is really part of the, the letting go process. Uh, now, I, he I heard the words grieving process because I understand that that means something to me. You know, grieving is not necessarily because somebody passes away, but because you're bringing something to an end. You know, just like, you know, I'm, I'm the one who asked for the, a divorce. And so on one hand, I was very happy when the divorce happened and when he moved out. But at the, on the same token, I was sad mm. because we had, we had a lot of good stuff that now I was going to miss. And so that's kind of where I feel like I am today is I'm going through the emotional or I'm entering the emotional process for letting go of what was because what is about to be is ready to open up for me. And it's just part of the natural process. And I'm, I embrace all parts of it. And it is kind of emotional. It's a little, it's, it's an emotionally vulnerable thing because I feel sad and I feel angry at the same time. <laughs> well, that's interesting. I mean, I, I'm sitting here asking myself about my niggly list, right? And asking myself if the day came with a niggly list or something like what was on the niggly list never came again, would I be grieving over it? Would I be sad over it? And I realized that my answer is, nah. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> Well, and for me, what I've, what, what's about to end is something that I've invested a lot of time in. Uh, my, my, my whole being has been involved in what's about to end. Oh, I see. And uh, so it, it's kind of like, you know, when, when you know one thing's ending and something new is coming in, you can kind of do a, a review of what's been, you know, what was good about it, what wasn't. Like, Years ago, when I had my costume manufacturing company, I had a partner, mm -hmm. and our partnership was not feeling very good anymore, and so I told him that I was going to leave the business, and as much as I was thrilled that I didn't have to deal with all sorts of niggly things, no, they were not <laughs> niggly, they were really monumental They're things module. that just okay. really drove me crazy, uh. I kind of was, went as, as, I was exiting, I remembered when we started and how exciting it was and how fresh and alive and what our dreams were for the business. And it's like, I remembered that with fondness. And so then there was a sadness because I was letting go of something that never really became what we wanted it to become. Oh. And then simultaneously, I was thrilled because the stuff that made me crazy was no longer going to be a part of my life. Well, that's a good part right there. Yeah. So to me, that's like that door was closing, you know, that business was closing and I was moving on to something else. And so, you know, and maybe this is just how I deal with things. But when I when I know something's ending, I tend to review it and, and look for the good in it so that I don't have to like I don't like slamming the door on something going, get out of here. I'm tired of you. I like to think about the positive aspects of even stuff I'm ready to be done with um, because I know that for me, I've outgrown where I am. It was a good match for me while it was here, but I've evolved, I've changed, and now it doesn't match me like it did when it was first in my life. So it's time to move on. It, it kind of reminds me what you were describing there of a uh, 
a scene from a British television show that my wife and I have often liked to watch called As Time Goes By. In this particular scene, there, there are two characters. One is Lionel, who's kind of a, an old curmudgeon, and the other is Sandy, who's the uh, uh, secretary of um, Lionel's wife. And, and she has a secretarial business. And Sandy is always the very positive and, and looking on the bright side kind of person without being quite the Pollyanna you are, but she still has a very positive um, outlook on things. And there, she's helping him move out of his flat because he's getting together to actually live with the woman he's going to eventually marry, Jean. And as she, they've moved everything out and they're kind of looking around. Sandy says, you know, when I left my last flat, I said, I, I, I turned to the flat, looked around, and said, goodbye, little flat. Just kind of, <laughs> you know, sadly. And Lionel says, well, I won't be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I will probably say goodbye, little flat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cute. <laughs> so we're finishing up... Um, so Oh, what's that? Yeah, what, I was going to say, what do we have on the agenda for today? Yeah, we're, well, we're finishing up part two. We've got a few more sections left of part two of the book, The Law of Attraction, The Basics of the Teachings of Abraham. And part two is where they go into detail about what the law of attraction is. We've, we've read most of the really good stuff, but, well, not this is bad stuff. It's not bad. It's just, this is like the, the miscellaneous stuff. In other words, different kinds of questions about, you know, little aspects of it that Jerry was asking that Abraham answered. And there's... I probably would say we're not going to get through all of it today, or maybe not even today or tomorrow. Well, but we're, we're going to get through these ironically, fairly quickly, I think. Ironically, I just looked, and we have 10 more pages for this, and mm -hmm. I'm like, we're good if we knock out one page or two pages a day, so I'm this not thinking true. we're going to literally read through 10 pages today. Well, we'll have, I don't think we're going to read through 10 pages. We may read through two or three, maybe even four, just because the topics are fairly quick, I think. Now, I could be wrong. But, well, let's, let's see, see what, what happens. What happens? Let's jump in. <laughs> so right now we're on page, I, I've got us on page 63. Is everything composed of mm -hmm. thought? Is that what you've got? Yep. Okay. So Jerry says, is everything and everyone composed of thought or by thought or neither? And Abraham says both. Thought can be attracted by other thoughts through the power of the law of attraction. Thought is the vibration that the law of attraction is acting upon. Thought is the stuff. I love that. That's one of those technical terms I use a lot. Stuff. stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Thought is the stuff or manifestation, and it is also the vehicle through which all things are, cre are attracted or created. I'm going to read that again. Thought is the stuff or the manifestation, and is also the vehicle through which all things are created or attracted. That's quite a concept there. See? Thought is the manifestation in some cases. Thought is the manifestation. So thought is, the, it, so I'm it's, going to add some words. Thought is both the stuff and or the manifestation. Yeah. And it's also the vehicle. So thought is also the vehicle through which all things are attracted or created. Pretty important stuff, this thought. <laughs> well, and you know what's interesting is um, what I'm about to say has only been in my awareness for less than a year, which is that thought itself, when you receive a thought, that is actually part of manifestation process. So when I heard that, I went, what the heck do you do with that? And so I've had to come to an understanding that there are thoughts that we think because we're thinking them, like we're thinking about stuff or you know, let, let's say I'm hungry and I'm thinking about dinner. So, you know, my stomach triggered the hunger and then the hunger caused me to think about dinner and what's in my refrigerator. All of that thought is just me thinking. That's Wendy thinking. I've initiated the thought. But then there's also a different kind of thought, which is the kind that comes sort of out of the blue where you weren't thinking it. There was nothing that triggered you to think a thought but a thought just came to you. And that is what Abraham calls receiving a thought. And when you receive a thought, that is actually part of the manifestation process. Yeah, that's interesting. It's interesting to me on two levels. One, because of the role it plays in the manifestation process. But two, 
because I'm still at times a little confused about a thought that I, I have and I ask myself, is it one that I originated or did it just come to me out of some who knows where? And often I, I can now tell the difference, but sometimes it's like, I'm not sure which it was. <laughs> well, and you know, honestly, I don't know how essentially important it is to actually identify it. Maybe. I think it's fun to identify. Um, when I absolutely know I received a thought because I was not thinking this before, but all of a sudden this thought popped in out of the blue, that well, that I label, I received a thought. And oftentimes I'm able to tell, oh, this is part of something that I have been desiring to manifest. So this must be part of the manifestation process. And the reason why that's significant to me is because, you know, manifestation always starts with a thought or a desire. And sometimes we don't see the three-dimensional manifestation for quite some time. Yes. Sometimes it's short, but sometimes it's a long time. And why understanding that a thought is part of manifestation, why that's important to me, is because a thought is tangible. Now, granted, it's not the same thing as holding something in my hand that is a three-dimensional object or being or driving a new car. That, that's obviously tangible. But a thought to me is tangible because one minute you don't have the thought and then the next minute you do. Okay. And so knowing that that's part of manifestation gives me incredible hope in recognizing that the three-dimensional form is going to show up soon, that it's on its way, that I've begun the actual three-dimensional part of the manifestation. Hmm. Okay. Well, I, I can kind of uh, identify with that, I think. I guess the only reason I believe that it, it has some importance to know whether or not I originated or it just came to me is that I'm still trying to learn the communication with inner being. And I'm getting better at it. I, I have some sense of what some of the signals are, but I really would like to know every time I've got a signal that it came from inner being rather than from my own conscious, so, you know, here's what I'm thinking about stuff. So I guess well, that's why I find I'll, it to be important. To, piggy, to piggyback on that, so yesterday, you know, I was having my experiences where I was getting this great understanding that, Project X was on its way, and it was feeling very expansive inside of me, and it was like awesome. So anyway, I was sitting at my computer and doing work, and then I was like, oh, I, I'm all out of my drink. So I decided to walk down the stairs to the kitchen to go get some water. And as I hit, just hit to the first stair, a thought popped into my head that was separate from anything else I had been thinking about before, because before I was thinking about my job. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the thought that popped in was about Project X, but in that moment, I wasn't thinking about Project X. And it was something to the effect of, it is so much bigger than anything you could have ever imagined. And that's when I remember telling you that, like, everything in me just broke up into tears, and I was filled with excitement, and it was like, oh, my God, it felt so spontaneous. The tears were spontaneous. And it showed up almost almost at the exact same time this thought popped into my head that Project X is so much bigger than I would have ever imagined. So that, to me, was a knowing that, one, that, came, that thought came from my inner being. I received that thought because it wasn't something I was thinking about for the moments or even, you know, maybe 30 minutes before. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that it, it was another piece of evidence to me that the manifestation is on its way. So the combination of the context and the extension of, of evidentiary nature, the fact that there is an evidentiary nature to it that you hadn't previously considered. Correct. Okay. Well, that makes sense so, because I think when I've, on those occasions where I have realized that I did have some sort of signal that I was receiving and you know, it kind of broke through my rather thick fog that this was not a thought I had originated. You're right. I tend to do stuff like that. I'll, I'll tend to ask myself, well, you know, what was I thinking about before that? And if I can't think of anything I was thinking about before that, then 
yeah, I guess, you know, by process of elimination, that's got to be something that came from somewhere else. Okay, I'll buy that. So here's the the rub, or, or actually the good thing. So what's the harm in believing that you received a thought and that it's part of the manifestation process? Is there any downside in that? that you can mm, think not of? that I can think of, no, not in terms of the manifestation process. And so what if it really wasn't a received thought? What if you just didn't even remember that you were really thinking on that subject, and all of a sudden in this moment you think you just received a thought, and you're, you're coming to the conclusion like, oh, oh my gosh, manifestation must be on its way. The way I look at it, I think you've probably just caused manifestation to start moving quicker because you got excited about it and you're feeling it. True. There's still the niggly Maybe part of no me, downside. though. <laughs> the, the niggly part of me wants to know. <laughs> it's like the you National Enquirer, you know? <laughs> and and it's, it's good to, I, I agree with you, it is good to want to know. And there are some times we can never be absolutely certain. So you take your best guess, and then you look at what's worst case scenario. Uh, that I'm actually moving toward that which I desire because I'm feeling into it and getting excited by it. Okay, I can live with that. <laughs> that that is a good outcome. I can't complain about that that outcome. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. So there's one little teeny paragraph left on this, and yep. it says, "See your world as a sort of well-stocked kitchen, where every possible ingredient that um, that has ever been pondered, considered, thought of." or wanted exists in an abundant, never-ending quantity. And see yourself as the chef, soliciting forth from the shelves of your kitchen whatever ingredients in whatever quantity you desire. And you are mixing it all together for the creation of your cake, which currently pleases you. No wonder your earlier example was about food. You were reading ahead. <laughs> I wasn't, but you know what? Honestly, normally I eat lunch before I do the show, and I didn't today. And I went, no, I think I'll be okay, but my tummy's grumbling. <laughs> ah, I see. Okay. Well, I, w I won't make any more mentions of food then. I don't want to torture you with it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but I really do like, I like the, um, oh, I just like all the ingredients of of this paragraph. I mean, I like thinking how, there's a never-ending quantity of all the different ingredients, and we're the chef of our life. And we get to create anything they, that we want. Anything that currently pleases us is what we can, you know, put in our mixing bowl and create. Yeah, it, it's a good metaphor, particularly if you like cooking. Um, unfortunately, I'm not really somebody who loves cooking, so I probably need a different metaphor. For me, it has to be something more along the lines of, you know, writing software, but... That's okay, you know, the, the metaphor still works. <laughs> I'm just being niggly, well, that's you all. Know, <laughs> well, I, and I, I've done some oil painting, and I have to tell you that I love getting all the different um, tools and paints um, to paint with because it, it's like when I sit down to paint and I have a blank canvas and I look at all the variety of paints I have and I have a huge variety of different brushes, and it's like, it is fun to know that I can do anything I want. I have so many choices, and I can mix up what's on the, the canvas in any way I want. And something else, I also learned about oil painting, which I think is really fun, is it's, um, it's, there's a style called wet on wet, okay. which is where you paint, you know, paint oil paints, which, by the way, are wet in the very nature of them. Mm -hmm. And if you don't add this little ingredient to it to help it dry quicker, it might take three weeks for it to dry. <laughs> if you put the, Literally, and if you put this little ingredient in, it might take only two to three days to dry. Wow. But what's cool is you can paint something, and then if you paint directly over it, that's called wet on wet. Mm-hmm. And it creates all sorts of new, just nuances. It's kind of like mixing yellow and blue, and you can get green. Ah. The only way, you have to wait for it to completely dry if you want to paint over it and have, like, the new color be co solid in its saturation. Ah, okay. And okay, why am I talking about this? Because to me, this is part of the creation process. 
See, I can wait for it to dry and then paint over it. I could mix it all up while it's wet. I can add new colors. I can mix the colors on a palette before I put it on the canvas. I can mix the colors directly on the canvas. It's like me, I'm the artist. This is me in my human life. And I get to decide how my life looks. I get to decide its texture. There are times that there are certain ways that I paint with certain brushes where I can make really thick, um, make the paint really thick and it kind of stands up on the canvas and it creates a very textured effect. But it's like, I get to decide all that. And to me, that's what Abraham's metaphor is about the chef in the kitchen, is that you get to decide all the different things, all the different mediums of life you want to play with. Well, you it's want true. To play I mean, with people. Because ultimately, we're, we're deciding what, what, not just what media, we're trying to decide what stuff do we want to include in whatever it is we're trying to create. It doesn't yeah. matter whether we're working with paint or anything else. What stuff do we want to include? It's entirely up to us. And so the, you decided you wanted to create a book. Mm -hmm. So what were your tools? Well, you reached out and found many life coaches. So we, as the life coaches, we were one of the tools. And then we each wrote and we used words. Words are part of the tools. Um, you know, and you're editing and you're using words and you're using a computer. But it's like all those things are creating a book. This is true. And you got, and you got to decide what you want in that book and what types of stories you want in that book and what types of writing you want. You didn't want just, you know, flat out article writing. You wanted stories that like, that move the reader in a way that they feel compelled to read to the end because they can't wait to know what how it's all going to end because it's a fun story. It's and like, they, those are things you got to decide. And by the way, they are fun stories. So if you're not a subscriber to the show, make sure you subscribe <laughs> because when when if when you're a subscriber, you're going to get a little advance warning about when the ebook is available because it'll be both a paperback and an ebook. And for a short period of time, to listeners of the show, the ebook is going to be available for like a two or three day period for free. So enough said. Yay. <laughs> so, you know, the title of this is, is everything composed of thought. Um, yeah, because we think thoughts and they become things. That about and summarizes all of, life it. Is, all, of all of life is composed um, initially of thought. You know, the sun, the moon, the earth, everything originated with thought. kind of cool all right well the next section then kind of addresses another little piece of this pie that we're baking it says i want more joy happiness and harmony which isn't really a question but let's see what jerry has to say <laughs> jerry says what if someone would say to you abraham i want to be more joyful how can i use what you're teaching to attract more joy happiness and harmony into my life well, well that seems straightforward but let's see what abraham has to say and abraham says first we would uh, we would compliment the person on discovering the most important desire of all, the seeking of joy. For in seeking and finding joy, you not only find perfect alignment with your inner being and with who you really are, but you also find vibrational alignment with all things that you desire. Now in italics it says, when joy is really important to you, you do not allow yourself to focus upon things that do not feel good. And the result of thinking only thoughts that feel good would cause you to create a wonderful life filled with all the things that you desire. End of telling. When you hold the desire to be joyful and you are sensitive to the way you feel, which, by the way, that's an important piece that we can need to talk about, mm. that you're sensitive to the way you feel, and therefore guide your thoughts in the direction of things that feel better and better, you improve your vibration and your point of attraction becomes one that will attract, through the law of attraction, things you desire. Now, again, in italics, deliberately guiding your thoughts is the key to a joyful life. But a desire, a desire to feel joy is the best plan of all. Because in the reaching for joy, you find the thoughts that attract the wonderful life you desire. There was an interesting thing here. There was a word you skipped over, and I'm wondering why they included it. Because when you skipped over it, I, I just started looking at it more closely saying, hmm, she skipped over that. 
in the second to last paragraph, it said, and your point of attraction becomes one that will, and the word you left out was only attract. You said mm -hmm. that will attract through the law of attraction things that you desire. I wonder why they said that will only attract through the law of attraction That's things that you desire. You improve, okay, you improve your vibration and your point of attraction becomes one that will only attract. Good I don't point. understand. I'm not quite sure. I, I mean, it actually made much right. more sense when you left it out, and and so I'm looking at like, <laughs> why did they <laughs> include that? that? Why did? But it could All be. Right, I'm going to read that whole. I'm going to read the whole paragraph again just to see if in context we can get that one because I think that's niggling at you. <laughs> it is. <laughs> okay, when you hold the desire to be joyful, and you are sensitive to the way you feel, and therefore guide your thoughts in the direction of things that feel better and better, you improve your vibration. And your point of attraction becomes one that will only attract, through the law of attraction, things that you desire. Oh, I get it. Okay. The only refers to attracting only things that are joyful. because those, you just, Yeah. Those yeah, are the things you desire. Ah, all right. Got it. Okay. Well, it's a small point, but it's still useful. Okay. So, you know, it says when you hold the desire to be joyful, that's what this is about. Yes. Then, when, when you're really focused on being joyful, that becomes your point of attraction, and then, therefore, that becomes the only thing that law of attraction brings to you, which is the things you desire. Well, I can certainly resonate with what's saying here, because um, once I understood that, I mean, first I understood just the basics, like they taught you in the movie The Secret, right? You know, ask, receive, believe, all that. But stuff wasn't always showing up, so I wanted to know why. So the next question was, well, what is, what's causing stuff not to show up? And that's when I finally ran into the concept of resistance and allowing, actually, it being related to what, what I'm resisting, and the resisting is why I'm not allowing, and wondering where the off switch was for the resistance and so forth. Well, as I went through all of that, I, I finally got to the point where I said to myself, well, if I need to constantly be you know monitoring my thoughts and constantly figuring out what what where my resistances are and so forth i'm probably going to go crazy and then i picked up the concept well all you have to do is just stay in alignment well how do you stay in alignment well that's being joyful oh so the whole solution is just to stay in a state of joy well shoot that's my goal i'm done here we go <laughs> but isn't it kind of fun the long journey that you went through in order to arrive upon that understanding that's a very charitable way of looking at it, looking at it. for me it was tortuous <laughs> going oh. through all that at the time i mean now it is now it's fine but when i first went through it i mean i was i was lost to a large extent trying to figure out what the heck is going on here and i came real close to throwing this whole thing out saying this stuff doesn't work like so many other people had said but there was just a piece of me that was saying no no, no stick with it stick with it and so I stuck with it. I'm still not sure why, but I did. And when I got to the point where it said, well, you just want to be in alignment, and that means just being joyful, then it was a relief. It wasn't that I enjoyed the process so much, but it was a real relief when I got there. Like, oh, okay, I can do this. I can handle that. Now all I have to do is figure out how to get to joyful. So each step along, this is how I see it, each step along the way, you were experiencing something that you didn't really like, and it caused you to have this, angst like this isn't quite it oh, yeah. i want something different very much didn't but like that it caused, but it caused you to ask new questions whether conscious questions or unconscious questions it was causing you to expand and bottom line it was leading you toward more clarity because every time you hit a different level you understood something a little bit more but that still wasn't satisfying. Mm -hmm. So you had more questions like, how do I get to greater satisfaction? Now, you might not have been using those words, but it sounds like that's, that's what, what you were was, aiming though. for. Yeah, oh, yeah, that was definitely it. And so you were doing what I call following the breadcrumb trail. Yes. You know, it's like each thing caused you to be in a different place. You gathered some new information. You asked some new questions, but you still wanted more. And then you kind of kept going and going until you landed on something that felt really good to you and you went oh okay let's let's work for joy joy is a cool thing i i, I want that yay and joy felt a lot more um what's the word i'm looking for attainable joyful 
It felt more <laughs> – well, it did feel that, yes, true. Uh, <laughs> But it also felt more attainable because I, I had experienced joy before, so I knew I could reach that one. I wasn't sure at the time exactly how to do it because I was nowhere near a joyful state. But that one I knew was possible. It became an achievable, attainable, possible goal to reach. And whether or not law of attraction was going to lead me there, I didn't know. But I knew what it was like to be there, so I figured I could get there somehow. That felt better. Because remember, I, when, when well, I'm going through all this, I, and, and when, you're, when you're going through this book for the first time, most often you're in relatively a beginner stage. In my case, actually, when I read this book, it was a little bit later on. But nevertheless, I was going through the concepts, even though I wasn't reading it out of the book. I was doing it kind of helter-skelter, willy-nilly, but I was working through the concepts. And when you're going through those concepts for the first time, you don't have a high level of belief yet. You don't have a whole lot of confidence in how law of attraction is supposed to work yet. I mean, yeah, you know the theory. But in practice, it's like, I'm not so sure about this stuff. This sounds like a bunch of nonsense to me. Well, that's where I was at going well, for it. That's why I was so uncomfortable. And, that, and that's an excellent point, that it, you knew it in theory or understood it in theory, but it hadn't become real to you or right. alive to you because you hadn't experienced it yet. Exactly, yeah. And, you know, one of the things I love that Abraham says is that only life experience teaches. That's Words right. Don't. It's true. And then they go on to say, it's so ironic that we use so many words, yes. because only experience is what teaches you. Living life is what teaches. But, you know, in, in the case of like reading a book, you read a book and you get a foundation of a whole bunch of principles or ideas, but then you go out and you live life, and some of those things all of a sudden connect like living the life connects to things that you just read. And you went, oh, this is what this means. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were a and lot of aha moments. moments. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so I kind of look at like any kind of self-help reading is I'm not going to know what to do with it all just because I read the book. It's the going out and living life that helps you to like make sense of what you just read. Right. Yes. Yeah. Without that, you're you're just spinning your wheels, really. Well, and the one sentence I said I wanted to address a little bit yep. was the piece about you have, um, it says, when you hold the desire to be joyful and you are sensitive to the way you feel. Yes. I'll tell you what, sensitivity to how you feel is one of the most paramount parts of really being able to utilize law of attraction in a way of being a deliberate creator. Mm-hmm. Because when you're not sensitive to the way you feel, you're kind of all over the map. I think that's one of the reasons why there are more women who latch on to LOA than men. Because men are taught to bury feelings from a very early age. So it, it is a bit of a struggle at first. You're trying to kind of, in a sense, reconnect to feelings that have always been there, but you've been repressing them for so long that you almost forgot they were there. That's, that is kind well, of tough. Know. And and I don't know that I necessarily agree it's a men-women thing, because I was definitely taught not to feel, and so I didn't. Okay, well, maybe um, not. But I will say this, that like many a client, the first thing we start to work on has to do with identifying feelings. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because I can say, you know, I, I, I can give them all sorts of principles, but it won't become alive to somebody until they can start to self-identify which direction they're moving. Are they moving toward their desired goal or away from their desired goal? Yeah, good point. Well, they're not going to know that unless they know how they feel because right. resistance always has um, an emotional component that does not feel good to you. So you have to be able to identify, does this thing we're talking about feel good to you or does it not feel good to you? And I've had many a client, they're like, well, I don't know. I'm like, well, do you want it? And they're like, yes. I said, okay. So it's definitely in the positive realm. What does that feel like? I don't know. <laughs> what are you feeling right now? <laughs> I don't know. And I'm like, okay. And I mean, sometimes I've had to get very elementary. And I don't mind because we are where we are. Um, and just starting with, can you feel anything in your body? Um, I'm not sure. Okay. And I'll say, you know, pinch your arm. Can you feel you pinching? Yeah, I feel that. Okay. That's a feeling. <laughs> 
it, you know, I said, that's a tactile sensation feeling. But I said, we have feelings in our body all the time. And it's like people haven't always known how to make a connection to a, a feeling within their body and a thought they're thinking. And that's what I'm trying to make the connection. Because when Abraham says, you, you know, it's important to be sensitive to how you feel, well, it's one thing to feel, but it's another thing to connect it to the thought. It is, and because and even more than otherwise that. Otherwise, you don't know what. Otherwise, you don't know which way you're headed. That's true. E even more than that, the thing that, I, I mean, I for the longest time had trouble um, identifying whether or not I liked something or didn't like something. You know, what kind of feeling I had about it, and it took me a while to come to to recognize that what I was really talking about was I didn't have a preference. Mm. And when you don't have a preference. That's not. That's actually a really bad place to be in. I didn't know that, but it's really a bad place to be in because without a preference, you can't feel. You got to have a preference in order to feel something. If you don't, if you don't have a preference, there's no difference. There's just no difference between well, A and B. So I'd say if you don't have a preference, then the feeling is probably what I would label neutral. It's not always. That's what I found. That's what, that, that's why I'm bringing up this point because it is not. In fact, often it is not neutral. Often we've made it neutral because we're you know acceding to uh, cultural beliefs or we're you know, we had a bad experience with what we really wanted, so we, we don't dare go there. Or you know, there's a whole host of, of possible reasons why we choose the the safer. I don't have a preference position, and we're so how, we're, we're often so, doing it in a way that we aren't even aware of it. Which makes it even more. But explain that to me. That's not making sense to me yet. Explain okay. how you can have it, be in a state of no preference and have it not be neutral. If you are, if you actually do have a preference, but it is buried, you don't know that you have a preference. Ah, so what you just said is because this is different. Is you're not aware of your preference, well, but it's not that you don't have a preference. As far as I know, if I don't if I don't feel the preference, if I don't have a sense of what the preference is, then I don't have a preference. That's the way it seems to me, anyway. When I'm in that that place now, yes, from a broader perspective, I see it way, the way you're saying that. Yeah, there really is a preference, but it's buried. But when you're in that moment, it feels like you don't have a preference. Okay, so in the moment, it feels neutral. Yeah, and what I've learned okay. is that it actually pays off. To if if you have no other way to make a decision, make one arbitrarily. Flip a coin, so that you're the one making the preference. Because what that tends to do is it tends to get you back into the habit of having a preference. And when that happens, I find that the buried preferences start to emerge. It's almost like it's safe for them to come out and play or something. That makes sense. So. Back to Abraham's point mm -hmm. that it's really important to to be sensitive to how you feel. It certainly is. Now, to me, that's like half a sentence. That was a phrase, and this whole book could just be. I mean, if you all you learned after reading this book was that it's important to be sensitive to how you feel, and then you figured out how to actually feel what you feel and be able to know what it is and mm -hmm. label it, mm -hmm. that would be the this whole book would be worth it. And we know that there's like so many other things that are in this book. It's unreal. But from my experience, both for myself and working with others, learning how to be sensitive to how you feel and then to be able to recognize what you feel is really important as a deliberate creator. You really need to know yeah. how to identify how you feel. Especially if you want to do it to any, any more advanced level than what The Secret teaches you. You have to. You're right. It's, an, it's, it's a necessity because otherwise you'll well, get you lost know, in the soup. Well, my whole Project X is me getting what I would call hot and cold signals. Mm. If I get a signal that feels really exciting and juicy, I know I'm moving toward Project X. Mm -hmm. If I get a feeling that's really unpleasant and comfortable and I'm filled with doubt and concern and worry. Granted, I did just label them all, but they're all like, Ugh, I don't like it. 
well, in those moments, I'm not moving towards Project X. I'm mm-hmm. moving away from Project X. Good thing you haven't had and, a lot of those moments. Well, I've had some. Yeah, but not a but lot. I also know, but I also know that I've had so many more yeah. feelings that were exuberant and wonderful that I knew that I created a ton of momentum oh, yeah. toward Project yeah, X. Yeah, it's definitely outweighed, no doubt about it. But regardless, it's still important that I was able to recognize what I was feeling to know which way I was going. Because, you know, the other day I was feeling some really ugly, unpleasant feelings. And if I didn't know that having unpleasant feelings had anything to do with the creation process, I could have allowed myself to wallow there for a really long time. And then I might have actually begun to thwart the momentum of moving forward. I yeah. might have actually started to slow down the train. Yeah, that's true. And I, I suspect we all do that a lot more than we realize. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a really and that's good point. Why I, that's why I'm pointing out that learning how to be sensitive to your feelings and knowing if, you're, if you like them or don't is really important to the creation process. Yep, it is. Because you're either in the process of creating or the process of discreating or not creating not bringing it into three-dimensional reality. Mm, yeah. You know, like I've had um, a number of conversations with somebody that I care deeply about, and I have said, you know, when I hear her talking, I'm like, I'm hearing double-minded um, words and thoughts. You know, on one side, there's, oh, I'm excited about this and I want this. And then as soon as those words are put out into the atmosphere... There's, yeah, but, there, there's a great phrase, yeah, but, mm-hmm. blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, the law of attraction works based on how you feel. Not your words, but your feelings. Mm-hmm. And this particular person is very expressive, and when she says something, she feels it very deeply. And so when she's expressing her excitement and exuberance for something, it's palatable. You can feel it. And then when she throws the yeah, but... You feel that side of it, too. And I've often said, you know, okay, look at it from law of attraction perspective. Law of attraction wants to match you up with what you feel. Well, what's supposed to, what is law of attraction supposed to receive from your broadcast? It's stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. I love it. I hate it. I love it. I hate it. I want it. I'm worried about it. I want it. But what if it can't happen? And that's something that I think many people, including myself, have done without recognizing what they're really doing. They're not recognizing that they're actually broadcasting a very mixed message, one that really has zero traction, and it can't build momentum. It's a wonder that we don't strip our own transmission, so to speak. Because we just keep stopping and starting and stopping and starting. And, you know, okay, put it in a year, take it out a year, put it in a year, take it in a year. It's like, oh, geez, will you please make oh, up your that's, mind? <laughs> that's a great metaphor. That's exactly. It's like if you're at the starting line and you're needing to travel one mile in a straight line and you put it in gear and put it in drive and then you slam the brake and you put it in park and you put it in drive and then you <laughs> slam the brake and put it in park, you're not going to get anywhere. Well, not only that, when you take it into the mechanic, the mechanic's going to look it over and say, how have you been driving this thing? Um, no, I'm really not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sitting here playing with the gears going, look, forward, back, forward, back, forward, back. <laughs> but, you know, that's, that's oftentimes, I think, what we do without awareness when we have the yeah, but syndrome. You know, we love the idea of something, we talk about it, exciting to us, and then heaven forbid, we go into yeah, but, and then we think of all the reasons why it couldn't happen, shouldn't happen, hasn't happened, or why the worst thing that happens, you know, has happened to this person, that person, or whatever, and now, you you know, you've completely talked yourself out of the possibility of that which you really desire. And it, it's not like the law of attraction ever is confused. The law of attraction is simply reading and feeling the broadcast. 
And if you broadcast one thing and then change your mind and broadcast something else, eventually you get nothing. Or whichever side of the equation you're actually a little bit more committed to in terms of how much airtime you're actually giving to it, that will determine whether something happens or doesn't happen. Or if it happens real slow. And you know what? I don't know many people who like their manifestations to happen slowly over time. No, not really. Nope. So that's boring. <laughs> when you want something, you kind of want it already. Well, there's also the flip side of it, too. What if, like you said, if, if the dominant uh, tendency is toward the negative side? Well, now you're getting a slow negative manifestation happening over time. Now, that, that's kind of like on the same order of taking a Band-Aid off agonizingly slowly so that you feel every hair being pulled out. Yeah, one <laughs> one hair pull at a time. <laughs> uh. Yeah. And yeah. I can say that with experience because that's where I was at at about the time I first watched The Secret. That's pretty much what I was doing without realizing it. Oh, the... A little bit forward, a little bit back, a little bit forward, a little bit back. That and, kind of thing. And, it, and it was a little bit more back than it was forward. So I was not only was I, I dithering back and forth, but the net result was moving slightly backward all the time. You were dithering. There's another great word. Isn't that a good dithering. one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the one thing I did not do is what's addressed in the next section. And I am very proud of myself that I did not do that. But I understand other people do. And I, I think it's why Jerry brings it up. But okay, it's, you want to go for it? it's related to this concept of joy. He says, isn't it selfish to want more joy? Some would say that for a person to want to be joyous all the time, that would be a very selfish way to want to be as though desiring joy is a negative. And there are a lot of people, I think, who might, you know, raise their eyebrows at that. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think I was so sh the, the word selfish was socialized to me in a way that it meant it was bad. You don't want to be selfish. Um, but, you know, in Abraham world, you can't be anything but. And they go on to say that. Well, they said, we, are often, we are often accused of teaching selfishness. And we always agree that we certainly do teach selfishness. For you cannot perceive life from any perspective other than from that of yourself. Selfishness is the is the sense of self. It is the picture that you hold of yourself. Whether you're focusing upon yourself or another, you are always doing it from your selfish vibrational viewpoint. And whatever you are feeling, that is your point of attraction. So if, so if from your perspective of self, you are focused in a way that you are feeling good, then your point of attraction is such that the things that you are attracting through law of attraction will please you when they get there. If, however, you are not selfish enough to insist upon focusing in a way that feels good and you are focused upon something that feels bad, then your point of attraction is such that you are negatively attracting and you will not like what is coming when it gets there. Unless you are selfish enough to care about how you feel and therefore direct your thoughts in such a way that you are allowing a true connection to your inner being, you have nothing to give any, another anyway. Everyone is selfish. It is not possible to be otherwise. And, and when I read that last line, I especially rejoiced because I've been teaching that to people before I even got involved with the law of attraction for decades and getting a lot of pushback about it because that goes against a lot of what society believes so society believes that it's actually better to help somebody else than it is to help yourself there are a lot of people there are an awful lot of people who get all worked up about people who do things for themselves rather than for others and say you know you should be paying more attention to others you you, you should be demonstrating that you care for others that this is a really big issue this is a big issue that a well, lot of people have to deal with. And I think that really grows out of, um, like this, this is an example, um, where there's a parent and a child, and the child is off playing, and the parent says, no, come in here and clean your room. And the child's like, I really want to play. No, come in here and clean your room. Well, 
who's being selfish in that moment? <laughs> Answer, both of them. Both of them are, yeah. The child, the child is saying, I want to play. But that's not the, the way society saying, perceives it. And I want you to clean your room. Yeah. Yeah, but the way the way and society so, perceives it, it's the child who's being selfish. The parent is being caring. And yet, it really comes down to if the parent is saying, come and clean your room, because that's what would make the parent happy. Yes. Then the parent is actually doing it from their own selfish desire to feel happy. And now we get and to the root of it. That's the real root of it right there. Yep. Because... What really happens nine times out of ten when someone is pointing a finger and saying you should be behaving a, uh, in a different way because you're behaving too selfishly, if you really look for it, you can find where the person pointing that finger is saying you're not satisfying me. Exactly. But that is not how we predominantly learn about selfishness because most of the time we learn it when we're so little yes. that we're not in our logical mind, we don't even have a logical mind created yet for us to think those kinds of thoughts. And so the idea is eventually the parent who's bigger and bolder and stronger kind of always wins, at least most of the time, unless you throw a tantrum, and even then they can still find a way to win. Mm -hmm. um, but then the child kind of gives up their knowingness that their selfishness was actually a good thing, and they give it up to make the parent happy. And so they've now traded what's important to them for what's important for their parent. And this is where our mixed training begins. In fact, this is the training ground for getting it screwed up. There are also a, a number of ways that the child can react. That is one way, and, and you're right, that is an excellent way that the child could react, an excellent description of a way that the child could react. Another way that the child could react is that the child learns that by producing behavior A, they get response B. And even if response B is a negative response, and I don't want that response, maybe it's more response than they're getting in general from the parents. So they say, well, I'll just keep pushing button A. I'll keep getting response B. At least I'm getting some attention. There you go. Yeah. yeah. So it shows up in a number of different ways, and it, it, it actually becomes quite destructive in the long run. Um, so I guess my point is we as a society need to kind of reevaluate this whole thing about selfish and say, well, stop saying that selfish is somehow a bad word. It really isn't a bad word. It's actually a very good word. And, and what is wrong is not when people are selfish, but when people accuse others of being selfish. There's almost always an ulterior motive going on that is not popping up to the surface. And I, I don't think there's anybody that I, I know of that would disagree with the thing that they teach on the airlines when they say, you know, if we should lose oxygen pressure, you know, the mask will come out, put it on yourself first. Right. And then put the mask on the child. Right. You know, and we all have, we do understand that concept that if you're struggling to breathe because you're so busy trying to put it on the child, you may not ever get it completely on the child because you might be dead. <laughs> and by the way, that but is a selfish motive. Wanting to get it onto yes. yourself first is a selfish motive. It has because to be. Because we really only have something to give when we are in our own place of alignment, when we're, we're exactly. feeling good. That's when it. we can breathe deeply, then we have the wherewithal to be able to help the child on with their mask so they can breathe deeply. But it's interesting because from the airline perspective, I don't know an adult that would disagree with that. Mm -hmm. However... When we turn it on the rest of our lives and look at what selfishness might be or not be, it's amazing how all of a sudden we lose that metaphor of what happens in the airline principle and all that are off and people go back to, no, I want you to do it my way because that's what will make me feel better. <laughs> Well, with the airline principal in the bank, we'll have to draw it to a close and say, okay, we'll pick this up next time. Before we go, how do they reach you in case they need some personal attention? WendyDillard.com. All right. Wendy, sounds great. Let's do it again tomorrow. I will be here. So will I. We hope that you'll join us as well here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye. -bye now.